currently, and he has been force-fed from more corned beef, green beer than he ever had in Ireland. Yeah. Connor Kennedy is an international recognized sought after speaker and educator, an award winning humorist and author. He is also one of the only, only 69 people in the history of Toastmasters to achieve accredited speaker status. I can't say that slowly. An internationally recognized speaker. Okay, they all say that, but he is? In places as diverse as Spain, Canada, Mexico, France, and of course, Ireland. Connor has been recognized by his wife and kids. <laughs> and as a sought after speaker, he has been chased by speeding cops in Europe and USA. <coughs> <laughs> this man is a former VP marketing, a District 30 International Humorous Speech Competitor winner, winner, a multiple author, and a man who provides substance with humor to improve people, performance, and productivity. Toastmasters, please welcome the happily exiled, Guinness drinking, corned beef eating, Connor Panini, who will speak to us about what Mark Twain learned him about public speaking. <laughs> minutes so just in case I don't get to the end of my presentation what I would like to do now is I would like to give you the end of the presentation <laughs> so thank you very much for the time we've spent here I hope in a short time we have given you some good ideas as to what Mark Twain can learn you about public speaking and I now hand it over to the wonderful diva of dialogue Cassandra Lee <laughs> so right so that's the end of the presentation now some of you who are Left brain are probably saying, hmm, the Irish man, he doesn't even speak proper English. What Mark Twain can learn you about public speaking. And those of you who know Mark Twain may know that he was a riverboat pilot. And he says in one of his wonderful books, Life in the Mississippi, he quotes his riverboat mentor, a guy by the name of Captain Horace Bixby, and he says, Bixby says, when I say I learn a man the river, I mean it. I learn him or I kill him. <laughs> and Twain goes on to write that the word teach does not appear in the riverboat vocabulary. So that's why I use the word learn in this presentation. The other thing that some of you might be saying is that, hmm, what can Mark Twain learn me about public uh, speaking? And you're probably saying, well, I know Mark Twain is author of Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures, Adventures of Ad, Tom Sawyer, etc. Uh, but Twain also, though, I can credibly say to you, was possibly the most successful professional speaker ever. And by that I mean that from 1865, when Mark Twain first spoke publicly in San Francisco, to the time of his death in 1910, he was an in-demand speaker who captivated audiences all over the world. Does anyone have any idea how many countries Mark Twain visited? Oh, maybe? No, that's a bit more than, uh, than, than he did. But he actually visited, my research suggests, about 30 countries. This was between 1860 and 1905, 1907. So I think his last visit abroad. The man was incredibly well traveled. He also was a financial wreck. And in 1895 he was bankrupt, so he had to take a world tour to try and gain some money to pay off his debt, which he was in. He insisted he would do. And in 1895-1896, Twain started a world tour which brought him from the United States to Australia, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as it was known then, Mauritius, India, South Africa, and back to the UK at 65, 66 years of age to packed houses. The man was a master of his craft on the stage. 
And what I would like to take you through this morning is a couple of quick examples and lessons from what Mark Twain learned me about public speaking. But the way I would like to do that is I thought I would give you just a little excerpt from one of his speeches. This is a speech that he did in London in 1907, when he was 67, he was 66, 67 years of age. So this is just an excerpt from it. So let's listen into this excerpt. Now what I thought I would do is I just try and get into a little bit of character. Out of curiosity, what colour suit do you associate with Mark Twain? White. 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 Okay. Mark Twain only started wearing white suits when he was about 66 or 67. He rarely wore them uh, before that, and then he didn't wear them that often after either. But uh, what I just want to do for a couple of seconds is just get into a little bit of character. So get both white suit. Uh, but he was also an inveterate cigar smoker. And the cheaper the cigar, the better. <laughs> uh, he said he had uh, cigars from Cuba, Havana, and he wouldn't smoke if he'd give them to people rather than smoke them himself. And he had one rule on smoking. My one, my one rule on smoking, he said, was never smoke when I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> never refrain from smoking when awake. And he just went through cigars all of the, the day. Now, let's listen into this piece of conversation. Those of you who are thinking it's a little, a little bit funny that an Irish man is doing a lecture by <coughs> Mark Twain. Yes. <laughs> there is not one recorded incident in all of the writings about Mark Twain that says, Mark Twain did not have an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's listen in. And he's Twain in London, 1907. And this shows the pathos, the passion, the pain, the humor, the inspiration that Twain was able to bring to his speeches. Let's start off. <clears throat> Since I came to London, my character has suffered a little. A man, a newspaper man, was walking around with a placard selling newspapers that read, Mark Twain arrives, gold cup stolen. <laughs> My character suffered as a result of that. But I must tell you that when I was in London seven years ago, I did steal something. I stole a hat. But it was a clergyman's hat, so that didn't really matter. <laughs> I was at a luncheon with Archdeacon Wilberforce. He left the luncheon before I did. He started this. He stole my hat. When I came out, I was looking for my hat, and I couldn't find any hat that fitted me apart from Archdeacon Wilberforce's hat. I should tell you that at that stage, I was the recipient of a very large amount of compliments and good words, and as a result, my head was a lot larger than normal. <laughs> I remember when I was walking home that I was getting a level of deference that was unusual, and by the time I arrived home, I had a much higher opinion of myself than previously. <laughs> <laughs> but I am joking now, and as a man reaches the age of 72, you will know that that person knows that life is made up of heartbreaking bereavement. With London, I have a pathetic association because seven years ago, after I returned from my world tour with my wife and daughter, my wife and daughter headed back to America to bring our eldest daughter back to London. She was 24 years of age and in full bloom and health. When my wife and daughter were halfway across the Atlantic, there was put into my hand a cablegram. One of those cablegrams that we all receive in terrible circumstances. And it read that that daughter of ours in America had gone to our final place. And so I cannot always be joking and laughing. And I must sometimes put the cave beside me and have the same griefs and frustrations that you have. And so I was really happy when our Master of Ceremonies here today said, using verses above me, he said, He lit our life with shafts of sun and vanquished pain, and thus two nations stand as one, in honouring pain, in honouring twain. Since I have arrived in London, I have received hundreds of letters from men, women and children. 
They contain in them compliment, praise, and affection. Compliment is well. Praise is well. Affection is well. But affection, above all, is the greatest reward that any person can achieve through character or through good deeds. And so, as I stand here in London, I know <coughs> that I am a person who, like being back in the United States, I am not an alien. I am amongst friends. Thank you. Well, that's just a brief example of the kind of work that Twain did. You know that he was famous for humor as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes' time. But what I would like to do is I would like to provide you now with nine lessons in the next two hours that will... <laughs> I don't have two hours, no? <laughs> okay, all right, I'll provide you with a few lessons, so in the next uh, 20, 15 minutes now probably I've got, that will help you to craft better speeches, and it's a framework I want to give you that will help you to use the kind of logic and the ex circumstances that Mark Twain brought to his presentations. Now, how are you, uh, I want to give you nine lessons. How are you going to remember anything about nine lessons in a short period of time? And uh, these lessons, by the way, are in a, a book that I've had published, which is titled Why Mark, what Mark Twain Learned Me About Public Speaking. But, realistically, you're not going to remember nine lessons, and it's going like, to be a really good way to remember it. So what I'd like to do, just for a couple of seconds, is I'd like to do a little bit of cheerleading. So we are, are we on some, some cheerleading? Yeah. This is so exciting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right, okay, give me an N. Yeah. Give me an A. Yeah. Give me an R. R. Give me a K. M-A-R-K. Give me a T. T. Give me a W. w. Give me an A. A. Give me an I. I. Give me an N. N. T W A I N. Twain. Twain. Right. Mark Twain. How many letters are on Mark Twain? Nine. How many lessons am I going to give you? Nine. Quite long time. Nine. Okay. All right. But the lessons though spell out the acronym Mark Twain. Right. What we do now is we'll try and go through a couple of them in a very short period of time. I'm going to give you now what those lessons actually spell out. And some of you might say, well, why don't you just put it up in PowerPoint? If you write them down, you're invested. All right? Okay. So M is for message preparation. Message preparation. A, audience. R, Relate to your audience. K. Know your objective. Message preparation. Audience. Relate. K is know your objective. T is for titter. Okay? Now, uh, uh, Mark Twain is famous for making people laugh. I can't get the word laugh into Mark Twain, so T is for titter. Right? <laughs> Uh, and apparently, I, I learned this at uh, Windy City, uh, someone said that there was a little bit of tittering, but I don't really use, really use the word titter, and uh, someone said to me, Connor, maybe you should get more abreast of American language and culture. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right. This came up at Windy City evaluation, my people, all right? So T is for titter, W is for wait. A, anecdote, I, inform, inspire, involve, inform, involve, inspire, N is for narration. So we've got tenor, weight, anecdote, involve, narration. Now, what we're going to do here is just give you a couple of quick examples, and we obviously can't go into the detail here. The first letter I gave you was M. M. And M is for? M. 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 One of Mark, Mark Twain's very good friends was a man by the name of William Dean Howells. And they were friends for 40 plus years. Howells was a writer and also a critic, and a very strong ambassador for Mark Twain. But uh, what Howells wrote about Mark Twain, he said that 
Twain studied every word and every syllable. And he memorized them with a series of mnemonics peculiar to himself. Mark Twain studied every word and every syllable, and he memorized them with a series of mnemonics peculiar to himself. Some people thought that Mark Twain was the most wonderful, impromptu, and extemporaneous speaker that they had ever seen. Except he wasn't. He was a wonderful, impromptu, and extemporaneous speaker, but he never relied on that. What Mark Twain did was he was actually spend a lot of time preparing his speeches. And in one of his speeches, he writes about that, the way I write a to create an impromptu speech is that one week before the event, I write out the speech in detail. And then I rework it and rework it. If one of the best professional speakers of all time spent time preparing his message, it behoves <coughs> each of you here to prepare your message. And it's not just Mark Twain that was uh, good at this. Uh, just a question for you here. Where were these words said? The question is, where were these words said? I have a dream today. I have a dream today that the little white children and little Negro children will be able to join hands together. The next sentence is, I have a dream today that this afternoon, right here in Detroit, Mark Twain's Washington speech was not a once off. Sorry, uh, Martin Luther King's Washington speech was not a once off. He had actually given something similar to that on a large number of occasions. And one of the most interesting ones, and it is available online, is the speech he gave at Cobo Hall on June 23rd, 1963, just about two months before the Washington speech. And he used the same kind of wording and terminology, etc. Something that he developed over a period of time. Martin Luther King prepared his speeches and prepared them well. And more and more towards the latter part of his life, he was actually working from memory more than anything else because a lot of the time he wasn't writing the speeches then, but he'd done his homework beforehand. There was a, a man who played uh, music here in Chicago last Tuesday, a little known rocker from New Jersey. Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, okay? Uh, he was on stage for three hours and 20 minutes, 66 years of age, running around like a little rabbit. He was brilliant, <laughs> as usual. Mark, uh, Bruce Springsteen played the Super Bowl in a couple of years back, he did a 12 minute set, right? He played four songs that he'd been playing for the previous 30 years. In preparing for the Super Bowl set, Clarence Clemens, who was the saxophonist, he's since uh, gone to the great uh, rock and roll plays in the sky with uh, Glenn Frey and, and others. Uh, Clarence Clemens said that for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday before the Super Bowl, the E Street Band practiced, practiced, practiced for 12 minutes music that they knew inside out. If the best artists, the best speakers in the world can take that time to prepare their material, you should take that time as well to prepare your material. And one of the things I would say to you is that when you're prepping your speeches, and particularly if you want to do well, I think, at international speeches, do try and take your material outside of the Toastmasters environment and see what other reaction is around the Toastmasters environment. That's one way to help you prepare your speeches. So that's for lesson one, message, message preparation. Let's go to W. And W is for? Wait, wait. Right. In speech parlance, give me another phrase for wait. Oh, oh. Oh, okay, all right. What do dogs and cats have four of? Five. Oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> I would reckon for most of you here, most of your speeches don't have one. Right? Mark Twain said, the right word is effective, but nothing is as timely as the rightly timed. Nothing, sorry, the right word is effective, but nothing is as effective as the rightly timed. Pause. The right word is effective, Nothing is as effective as the rightly timed pause. Now, Twain was famous for his ability to convey communication through pausing. And each of you here, you've seen Preston a little bit in his speech. When you pause, you get people thinking. When you pause, 
you're communicating more than when you're speaking a lot of the time. And those of you who, know, uh, who are married will know the power of the sound of silence. <laughs> right. Now, another example of the power of the pause. La just last year, Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking at the United Nations. And in a very impassioned speech, he was giving out about the lack of support that he saw that Israel was getting from the international community. And he spoke about the utter silence. The deafening silence. <coughs> Forty-five seconds later, he started talking again. Right? And what happened with that speech was that he had people thinking about what he was saying for a start. But also, though, that speech was so powerful and that extended pause is so powerful that all of the news media took up the story. And as a result of that, because he shut up 45 seconds, he communicated way more than he would have he'd kept talking for those 45 seconds. Now, for you as a speaker, especially if you're not used to it, pausing can be a challenge. So, the funny thing is that staying quiet, quiet can be the hardest thing for a speaker in front of an audience. So, for you, if you're not used to pausing, what I would suggest to you is that when you're writing out your speech, write in four letters, or you, or you want to leave a, a pause, or you think it will make an impact, write in the four letters, which is what I do, P-A-W-S. Alright? Okay, I'm not very good at spelling, alright? But that's the, that's the logic that I use in it. But my basic point is that if you want to build impact in your speech, one of the best ways to build impact is by shutting up. Right? If you want to build impact in your speech, you've got to plan to build impact in your speech. So don't just write the words. Right with poems as well. And this is where I'm going to pause. No, but what happens you is if you're not used to doing this, when you pause for 0.7 seconds, you will think, oh my god, oh my, this is the longest period of my life. Right? <laughs> but what actually starts happening is the next time you'll do it, you better pause for one and a half seconds. And you'll think, this is incredibly long. But then after a few times of trying it or getting used to it, you will pause for the relevant amount of time, the appropriate amount of time. And sometimes that will differ depending on the audience, depending on what your message is. And even the same message to a different audience can differ as well. But one of the very simple ways, theoretically, that you can, and I say theoretically because pausing is hard, but one of the very simple ways that you can make a real impact on your presentations is by adding a pause. <coughs> right. So let's go to the concept that Mark Twain is probably most famous for, and that is uh, for making people laugh, and for and the word is uh, titter. And Mark Twain, I spoke about the importance of knowing your audience, what I reference that, and also about relating to your audience. And Mark Twain wrote on one occasion about Chicago, and he was quoting the devil, Satan, in uh, one of his uh, books. And uh, Satan says, You people from Chicago think you're the best people down here in heaven. <laughs> you're, you're not. You're simply the most numerous. <laughs> so, and I know Twain used that uh, kind of phrasing in other cities as well, but he actually you referred to a particular city he was in, he would be able to drop that line in. But what Mark Twain did was he added real humor to his uh, presentations all of the time. So, what advice can I give you on adding humor to presentations? Okay, when you get someone laughing, and when you laugh, what actually happens is that there is the uh, neurons that start running around in your, your brain, okay? All right. And uh, you've got uh, these things that are running around in your brain. Now, when you smile, all the people smile as well, all right? Uh, so, what I would suggest to you is find ways to get people to, to smile. Now, the way to do it is, when you make someone, when you make a joke, or you say something funny, what do people do? Laughing. Right. So let's see. If I was to give five quick lessons and uh, help you to bring humor to your presentation, what might be a good acronym? That's got five letters in it. Humor. Laugh. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's say very, very quickly. Laugh. All right. An acronym. The first thing about adding humor to your presentation. L is for. Hold on. Let me check. 
No, no, it's, it's, it's for listen. listen. All right, okay, all right. Right. And the basic idea here is that almost certainly the last 24 hours you have said something to someone that made them smile or made them laugh. You probably don't remember what it is you said. But almost certainly you did say something to make someone laugh or, or, or smile. What I would suggest to you is that from now on, when you say something that gets someone smiling or laughing, Listen to what you say and take note of it. And I promise you that even if you think you're not funny, what you will find is if you do this practice for 25, 30 days, you will have 25, 30 pieces of material that was some way funny to someone. Whoops, I'm running out of time, right? Um, so, um, that's lesson one. Listen, pay attention. Listen, and lesson number two is anecdote. And the best example I'll give you here, I'll take two of them together, anecdote and you, is used for being uncomfortable. Right. Just take Prez's example of when he had the uh, punctured tire in his speech. All right. Do you think that when that happened, actually happened, Prez was laughing at, at the time? <laughs> All right, okay. So basically what Prez did though was he took an anecdote that at the time where he felt uncomfortable, I was able to make something humorous about it. Right? For you, each of you have had anecdotes where you've been uncomfortable, but which were not life threatening. Right? And what happens is that you would, four days later, you'd be at the kitchen table or at the coffee table, and you'd be telling your friends about the anecdote, and they're laughing. So what you're doing is, now you're listening, you then are say, giving an anecdote that initially was uncomfortable. And that will make a difference. So the final one is that, uh, final two, G is about Google. If you're looking for material for your speeches, just get onto the Googler, okay? All right? And if you Google on Bing, what will happen is, so, if you're, so let's say you're looking for something on sales, that stands involved in sales and training, just look for jokes about trainers. All right? Jokes about salespeople, etc. And it, depending on what the context is, you may well be able to drop something like that in. But the Googler is a real powerful tool for you. The final one is that H is for he, he, he. All right? All right. And he, this, in a sense, goes back to help or listen. And the basic idea is that in your speeches, you will sometimes hear a he, he, he. All right? So why don't I just put it in here from this side of the room or over here? You have got the makings of a, a noble tree there, right? So what you've got to do is you've got to water that E, 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 and ultimately take it from E, E, E to O, O, O. Right? It's a simple concept again, but it's about just being aware. So that basically is what I want to leave you with uh, right now. Unfortunately, I don't have any further time, but I wish you all the very best of luck. And as I said at the start, thank you very much for your time. Uh, there were some lessons on what Mark Twain learned you about uh, public speaking and how you can captivate your audience. And we now hand it over to the wonderful diva of dialogue, Cassandra Lee. Thank you very much.